Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, here in Silicon Valley at 13th Cloud Expo, fourth Big Data Expo, second SDN Expo. So many things going on. Three o'clock we've reached on day one. We are getting closer to our welcome reception. Do not forget that. I'm sure you are aware. You have to get to that welcome reception to be fed, watered, and get your first sneak glimpse at who is exhibiting this year. Lots of new players, so there's lots going on. But before that, I w I'm not going to say an old player, but a tried and true player, Oracle, up next. Rex Wang, one of our favorite speakers, giving a topic that is obviously giving a hostage to fortune. There's going to be tweets galore. There's going to be arguments about what only 10, et cetera, et cetera. Let's give it up, please, for Rex Wang, Vice President at Oracle, who is going to debunk all cloud computing's major myths in a quick 45-minute sequence. Thanks, Jeremy. Take care. Thank you, everybody. And thanks, Jeremy. This is great. It's great to see everybody here today. This is actually um, Oracle's ninth appearance at the Cloud Expo, believe it or not. We started here in 2009. And uh, Jeremy and his team do a great job, and we're really happy to, uh, to, to talk here. So uh, I'm a vice president at Oracle. I, I look after Oracle's overall cloud strategy, as well as things like database um, and systems management and so forth. Th that's the sphere of what I do. And uh, what I'd like to do today is to cover um, what we see as a, as a common mis set of misconceptions in the marketplace, the 10 myths of cloud computing. So. Understanding cloud, you know, I, I'm sure I don't have to give this room a definition of cloud. I'm sure you've already seen many definitions. Yet, the understanding of cloud isn't that great out there if you take a look at this. In a survey that we, we saw last year, over half the people, over half the survey people, 1,000 adults in the US, said that stormy weather could interfere with cloud computing. Over half said that they don't use cloud computing very often. However, they are common users of online banking, shopping, and so forth. 22% admit that they've uh, pretended to know what cloud is with their boss or during a job interview. And 59% actually believe cloud is going to be the workplace of the future. So, you know, as you can see, in this room, I believe the, the understanding of cloud is extremely high, but in the general population, I'm not really sure that it is. Let's start with uh, the first of 10 myths. One popular myth that's out there is that eventually everything will go to the public cloud. Cloud will become like an electric utility or a water utility. No one has their own electric power plant or water generation facilities. You know, it'll just go completely to the public cloud. That's a very common perception. Well, this survey is something that we ran uh, in a couple years ago in 2012 and also in 2010. And unsurprisingly, it really shows that cloud adoption for both public and private are increasing dramatically. But it shows that the overall adoption levels of private cloud are actually significantly greater than public cloud, as you can see. The red line is higher than the blue line. Both are increasing dramatically. The, uh, the rate of increase, though, of public clouds is faster and perhaps it'll overtake. This is a survey that we ran through the independent Oracle users group. So let's acknowledge that there's some sample bias here. We surveyed Oracle customers in, in this survey. Yet, if you talk to any of the analysts, Gartner and IDC, they're gonna share similar data. I think IDC published a report recently, this year, that said that uh, I think private cloud, the, the market is something like $12 billion, and public cloud is something like 11 or 10. So it's very close. So they agree that there is more private cloud in the marketplace than there is public cloud, but I think the two will converge and potentially public clouds will exceed private clouds in the next couple of years. The second myth. Some people are very black and white about cloud. You know, they have a very rigorous set of definitions. You have to have the following criteria and they argue about is this cloud or is this not cloud as if there is only one or the other. You're either cloud or you're not. We don't agree with this. We see cloud as a continuum, as an evolution. And we see a lot of customers that are on different parts of this evolutionary path. For many, the evolution to cloud began 10, 15 years ago, even before the word cloud was coined. A lot of our, a lot of our companies who tend to be you know, larger customers, 
they start with uh, thousands of applications in their install base, in, in, their, in their data centers. These tend to be physical silos and dedicated silos, very inefficient. You know, these silos tend to be sized for peak workload, and they tend to be very heterogeneous. They're not all Oracle, they're not all Microsoft, they're not all IBM. They, they could be open source in there. It's, it's a heterogeneous stack. So it's the fact that these silos are sized for peak load that delivers you know, extra capacity, unnecessary capacity, as well as um, the heterogeneity, which drives a lot of the cost and complexity. So what's the solution to that? The solution is well known. It's consolidation, right? Companies have been on the path towards consolidation for years. Consolidation is a long-term project. Um, for many companies, it's, it's you know, 10 years long or longer. We see consolidation as one of the first steps towards cloud computing. It's the idea of moving multiple applications onto shared platforms and shared infrastructure. You know, as long as the resources are shared, elastically scalable, et cetera, this is one of the steps in the, towards cloud. We see customers doing consolidation as a long-term, multi-year engagement, moving onto a standardized shared platform, as well as shared infrastructure through virtualization. Um, I would say that 95% of the customers that I see are doing consolidation in some form, but they're not done yet. It's a long-term trend. They continue on that path. For some, it makes sense to go the next step, to extend to a self-service private cloud, offering end users with self-service provisioning, monitoring and management, offer automatic scaling according to policies or rules set by IT or by the service provider, and to do metering and charge back to you so you can allocate the cost of the cloud, of the pool, to the individual consumers of that pool. So not everybody is willing to make this next step. In our surveys, it's, it's around 20, 25% of the population. If you think about it, not everybody needs self-service, right? I mean, if you're an IT organization that's only standing up uh, 20 environments a month, something like this, why would you offer self-service for your end users? It doesn't make any sense. Only if you have a sufficient number of provisioning events, deployments, would you, would you in fact do that? So in our customer base, we see probably 20 to 25% of the people moving to this next step in the evolution. Um, another step, of course, is, is public clouds. There are numerous clouds out there. It's a very dynamic marketplace. We see many, many new SaaS companies and, and infrastructure companies springing up all the time. These service providers tend to be very specialized, right? Because they want to offer one service to as many tenants as possible, to many, as many customers as possible. That's how they're very efficient. So they, they try to offer a one-size-fits-all model, but they end up being very specialized in, in what they do. The, the result of that is that customers cannot get all their services from a single cloud provider, right? So they end up using multiple cloud providers, and in cases where these apps are are, uh, they require some kind of uh, communication, you actually create an integration problem when you, when you do that. So the fact that the marketplace of public cloud services tends to be very specialized leads to this uh, increased need for integration. Public clouds also are shared, right? They are, that's one of, the, one of the characteristics of cloud. Well, there's, there's a consequence of living in a shared environment. You know, for example, um, if the service provider says, I'm gonna take everybody down on Sunday at three in the morning for an upgrade. I'm gonna upgrade everybody's application from version X to version Y, and you're gonna go down for two hours in order to do that. Well, none of the tenants on that shared solution have a say in that matter. So, you know, if you are okay with the fact that you're gonna be down on a certain time window, um, fine, but in some cases, some customers are not okay with that. So I think that, again, you have to tolerate the fact that you're living in a shared environment. It may be okay for some customers, not okay for others. You know, the, the end state that we see here is a, is a hybrid world, right? Where customers have the choice of deployment and they have the flexibility to not only choose the deployment model, but also move it and change their mind later on. What if the, the cloud, what if that cloud that I'm using gets too expensive? Can I move to another cloud? Can I bring it back on premise? So I think that um, the world that all of us are looking forward to is a hybrid world where there exist standards, that all the vendors are compliant with those standards, and that will be enabling this, uh, this world of interoperability and choice. So this is an evolution, you know, we see customers 
at all stages of this evolution at the same time. It's not that the customer moves entirely to the public cloud or entirely to a self-service model. Many of our customers occupy all five phases of this at the same time. The pattern that we see is that many of our customers are starting with consolidation onto a shared platform. Some of them are choosing to extend to a self-service private cloud when it makes sense. And they're on a case-by-case -case basis looking at the marketplace of public cloud services, trying to find services that meet their requirements and using them where appropriate. This is what we see. The third myth. Clouds are a one-size-fits-all model, right? And I think that this is an interesting one. You know, it's not the case that all clouds are the same. These are the three basic cloud layers. No surprise to anybody, I won't bother to define them. The obvious difference in what these things are is the fact that in the case of infrastructure, the service provider is managing that layer and the user or the consumer has to manage everything above. They have to deploy it. They have to manage it, they have to update it, patch it, et cetera. So that's the, the nature of this. On the, on the far right, a SaaS application is the most ready to use out of the box. It requires the least on behalf of the user. However, it's the least flexible. It does one thing, it does that application that manages that business process um, and nothing else. The infrastructure cloud is therefore the most flexible cloud, whereas a SaaS cloud is the least flexible. These clouds differ by the class of user, right? They differ, they range from a business end user for SaaS applications to developers to other IT pros. And the adoption of these three clouds we see as driven by three different sort of trends in the marketplace. The adoption of infrastructure as a service tends to be driven by consolidation and the desire to save money. The, the driver for platform as a service tends to be development. Can I develop an application faster and can I develop it on top of a platform so I don't have to worry about that platform? I want to focus on my differentiation and innovation, that is the application layer, and let somebody else deal with the underlying platform, hardware, and data center. So the, the, the driver for PaaS tends to be application development. And then SaaS, it's obvious, the driver tends to be a business user wanting some new function sooner, faster. Therefore, cloud seems to be the, the fastest way they can get a new capability. So different clouds, very different users, different trends driving them. The other way people slice and dice this universe, of course, is by deployment model. Public, private, hybrid, and managed. Managed private, for example. So there are many choices here, and the takeaway that I'd like you to have is that these clouds are very, very different, and they give customers a lot of choice, and while choice is good, it may also be confusing for some customers. So just be aware that there are many options out there and, and many sizes for different customer models. Let me move on quickly to the fourth myth, a very common one, right? Virtualization, hey, I'm virtualized, don't I have a cloud? Virtualization is cloud for lots of people. Let me not, uh, you know, say too many negative things about virtualization. Virtualization is a wonderful technology. It's been around for a long time, going back to the mainframe days even, and it's a great way to take advantage of increasing power in, in hardware by the ability to divide up that power and use it for individual purposes, maintaining good isolation. There's no question that virtualization has really taken off in the marketplace, but you know what? We actually see different kinds of clouds besides virtualization. This is the same survey I showed you earlier when we surveyed what kinds of clouds are our customers using. When we double click on that and ask them what kind of cloud do you have, we find out that a lot of our customers actually have interest in the so-called platform as a service layer, things like application server as a service, database as a service, and identity as a service. These are more popular in our customer base relative to infrastructure, things like general purpose compute, which is that virtualized computing, general purpose storage, and dev and test, which primarily is the use of virtual machines to do dev and test. Now this is a finding that I think is different than what you're gonna hear from a Gartner or an IDC. But again, I'll acknowledge that there is sample bias here. These are, the, these are Oracle customers that we've surveyed. So who are Oracle customers? Well, they are customers that typically use database, you know, WebLogic server and our products. In our customer base, we see very strong adoption of platform as a service, moving onto a shared elastic 
platform, a database as a service offering, an application service as a service offering, et cetera. You can see the same pattern persists, you know, the, the growth from 2010 to 2012, and the fact that there is more private than public, that is the red bars are longer than the blue bars. So very consistent with that last picture I showed you. This just goes to say that, you know, virtualization is not the only thing out there. There are other forms of cloud as well. You know, one of the very strategic decisions that our customers face is in fact this one. You know, many of our customers start out trying to do consolidation and the first thing they think of is let's just use virtualization and share hardware. Why not? It's quick and dirty. It's fast and easy, right? Because I don't need to worry about anything. I just take my stack I just put it in a virtual machine and everything works. And wonderfully, I'm able to save hardware, costs, power, cooling. And, and it does indeed result in good CapEx and OpEx cost savings. However, it doesn't actually change the structure of the O&M costs above the hardware layer. You can see here in this diagram, you still have all the heterogeneity there. You've got you know, the, the red, blue, and gray stacks to manage. And you typically have different administrators for each of those services. So you haven't changed the cost of the, of the silos above the virtualization layer. So there's a limit to how much cost savings you can achieve with this. The other way that people do this, of course, is consolidation at the platform level. Now let's acknowledge this actually requires standardization on a given platform. Um, such as Oracle Database or Oracle WebLogic Server. If you can consolidate and standardize on a certain type of database, a certain version level, you can actually achieve greater cost savings. You can reduce the operational cost. You can also accelerate the development of new applications. So for many customers, this is the preferred option. A lot of our customers actually have kind of a, a waterfall decision process, right? What they do is they inventory all their apps. I've got a thousand applications. Which ones can I actually standardize and consolidate at the platform level, at the, let's say, the middleware level or the database level? If I can do that within a reasonable amount of time, let's say a year or two, I will prefer to do that. But if I cannot standardize on a standard database or a standard uh, application server, then I'll fall down and, and just you know, virtualize my hardware and deploy uh, consolidation at the infrastructure level. So this is an interesting and strategic decision that a lot of our customers are reaching. It's not really an or, it's really an and, as I, as I said earlier. It's really, I prefer to do it at the platform level if I can, but if I cannot, then I'll do it at the infrastructure level. Um, I'll, I'll mention one other thing, you know, uh, we're Oracle and we're well known for having a market leading database. We recently released Oracle Database 12C in, in, in the summer. This is an interesting technology. This is a breakthrough architecture that employs a form of virtualization at the database level. You know, we have this concept of pluggable databases that plug into a shared common container database. From an application point of view, each pluggable database looks like an independent database. And, but there is a lot of sharing going on. That container is where there's a common set of background processes and a common set of memory. This architecture results in essentially multi-tenancy at the database level with good isolation. It's much more efficient in terms of how it uses hardware. It's much more efficient for your DBAs because they can manage the entire container database as one. They don't have to manage each of the PDBs. Um, these pluggable databases can literally be plugged and unplugged, so easy to provision, easy to move, easy to clone, easy to upgrade the entire container. No application changes are, are, are necessary, so all your existing applications can run in these PDBs without change. Not only that, all the features that you know and love in Oracle Database run in, in, in another manner as well. So again, there's an alternative way to do sharing it doesn't require a virtual machine, a hypervisor, in order to achieve some of the benefits of cloud. So this is another, another technology. All right. Myth number five, cost reduction is the biggest benefit of cloud. 
Well, yes, we agree that cost benefit is indeed one of the big motivators of cloud. But in our customer base, we actually see a shift going on. A lot of our customers are motivated by hard cost savings, but increasingly, a larger number of them are now motivated by speed and by agility and flexibility. They want the ability to deploy applications faster, to get access to computing resources faster through things like self-service, through things like a standard service catalog where they can pull up a, a well-defined um, configuration. And they want elasticity, the ability to uh, scale out and back down um, automatically within certain policies and rules, but they don't know exactly what the workload will be, so they want the underlying platform or infrastructure to have that elasticity associated with it. So in our customer base, you know, a lot of our customers start out being motivated by cost savings, but eventually they realize that the big benefit of cloud actually is around speed, speed of deployment, and around agility and flexibility. Myth number six. Clouds run on commodity hardware, commodity components, right? I mean, it's, it's the conventional wisdom that, hey, if I have a cloud, who cares what it's really running on? I can just use commodity software and commodity hardware. Why does it matter? Well, that might be true if you're a consumer, but if you're a provider, I would argue that's not the case. You definitely care what the hardware and, and components are because you're the providing that service. And, you know, it's important to understand that you know, there's really a, a set of choices here. You can create a cloud out of commodity components that you assemble yourself, but it requires work for you to do that. And, or you can actually build a cloud out of some more optimized solutions, such as Oracle's engineered systems, right? Engineered systems, for those of you who don't know, um, is a fundamental to Oracle strategy. We've been integrating hardware and software together to deliver a purpose-built appliance that can deliver an order of magnitude better performance than anything else in the market. We provide both. We provide the best of breed components, and you can integrate them yourself, but we also provide an engineered system that delivers breakthrough performance, and as a result of that performance, it also delivers better TCO, because an engineered system can deliver more compute in the less hardware, and so it winds up becoming lower TCO as well. But stepping back, the, the, the conventional wisdom that I'm challenging here is that all clouds are made out of commodity components. We disagree. We think that um, some clouds are better built out of engineered systems rather than commodity components. The Oracle cloud is built out of engineered systems, for example. Myth number seven. One of the big concerns that people have around cloud is that it will lock you in, right? Cloud lock-in. There's no question that customers value choice, and they value the ability to change their mind later. <laughs> um, this is illustrated by Herbalife, one of our customers who says, you know, we're, it was very important to them that we gave them multiple deployment options, right? They, they took one of our applications, I believe it was our human capital management application, and they, they want the ability to change their mind. They may want it originally, initially, as a cloud service offered by Oracle. But they want the choice to be able to take that and put it on premise, on hardware and in data centers that they already own. They want that choice. And so for them, it was critically important. When you look at a public cloud especially, but also private clouds, you should ask yourself, is it built on industry standards? Is it built on things that you know, my people understand, that I'm not doing something special to learn? Is, are my applications available in both a public and private cloud model? There are a lot of vendors out there who will make their services available only as a public cloud, but you don't, do not have the option of deploying it on premise. We think that that choice is critical, and one of our strategies is absolutely to make sure that our, the same software that we provide can run on premise uh, in a private cloud or in our public cloud. Make sure your applications can run in any place without change and make sure that the APIs are there to allow you to do these changes. Okay, the next myth. Um, for some people, cloud is, is nothing but an economic model. For them, for them, it's like, hey, I actually prefer to just pay as I go 
right? Metered use is what they call it in the industry. Um, so some people believe that cloud is all about pay per use. Actually, pricing is a very complicated subject. Many of you know this. We see lots of different models in cloud. You know, there is true pay per use, utility pricing, where the metric may be, you know, uh, per, per hour of computing or per minute of computing, per gigabyte of storage, per API request, per gigabyte of network traffic that's, that's uh, transported across the network. Lots and lots of metrics. Um, this model is true utility, meaning that if you stop paying, your service goes away, right? Whether you use it or not. The pro of this model is that it's very flexible, right? You can, if you scale up your usage, your costs go up in proportion. If you scale back down or turn it off, you, you have that very a lot of flexibility. The downside, though, is that it's very hard to predict what your costs are. And a number of folks that I know have been bitten by the inability to predict their costs in advance. So they wind up with a big bill. Um, Yet, this environment makes sense for some applications, those that, are, that require temporary environments, those that have unpredictable spiky workloads or unpredictable growth. Dev and Tess is another great example of using this kind of utility model. But another kind of model that's popular in cloud, of course, is subscription. This is the right column. This is where typically, um, let's say an application, the typical pricing model is you know, per seat per month. And the, the vendor might sell you uh, a, a bundle of 10 seats or 100 seats or 1,000 seats. Um, but this is a subscription, right? What that means is that it, it's like your, your cable television at home. It's a subscription. Whether you watch television or not, you're going to get charged, right? That's, that's the difference between subscription and utility. Utility, you, if you don't use electricity, you're not going to get charged for it. But television, even if you don't watch it, you're going to pay for it, right? That's what's going on here with the subscription model. The subscription model gives you better predictability, but less flexibility. So, you know, there's a lot of different pricing models out there. And, you know, the, the takeaway that I'd like you to have is that you should look at cloud pricing and pick a model that, that suits your need and your, your use case. Okay, moving on. Public clouds are not secure, right? This is a number one uh, barrier to adoption of public clouds. It comes up number one in every survey. Um, it's still the number one reason people are hesitant to use public clouds. My, my point of view on this is that the, the, the perception, the prevailing perception out there uh, is shifting, right? For some customers, um, using a public cloud service is actually potentially better than their own security. It just depends. Some organizations want control and they want visibility and therefore they prefer to maintain everything in-house on a private basis. For other organizations though, they might have a limited expertise in security. They might not be familiar with all the actual re regulations and requirements. They may not have the ability to run all the required audits and compliance assessments. They may not have the ability to make sure that the hardware and software are constantly updated with the latest security patches. For these kinds of customers, relying on a public cloud may actually be a better option. So, you know, I think that uh, people are gradually shifting their point of view on this. For some customers, um, public clouds and relying on a service provider to provide a secure service is a viable option. Uh, for others, they prefer that control and visibility and want to maintain it in-house. And I think we can understand the reasons for both. Perhaps uh, a hairier issue than actual security and privacy is regulatory compliance. As you know, certain industries and certain countries require uh, data residency and they have other uh, laws around how, how data must be handled, safeguarding of data, et cetera. And I think that's a much bigger issue than privacy or you know, protection against intrusion and attacks. I think the, the compliance with government regulations and industry regulations is a much more significant issue than is security and privacy. Okay, so uh, the last uh, myth that I'll cover today before I show you a, a, an interesting video is myth number 10. A lot of customers have the idea that they need to 
you know, they should they should look at this marketplace of public cloud services and just pick the best service that's out there. I mean, there's a different service provider for every need. Why don't I just choose the best of breed CRM solution, the best of breed HR solution, the best of breed ERP solution? And I think that's a, a, an approach that makes sense, particularly because there really aren't a lot of cloud providers that provide that full breadth. You can't get everything from a single provider. You know, we, we did a, a survey, um, I think this was earlier this year, and we surveyed 1,300 business managers, and the data was a little surprising to us. It was about how, how bad it is with respect to integration. You know, 54% of these respondents said that they had their staff were, were, were down, they were not productive because of integration problems across clouds, right? So it wasn't okay just to use a cloud service. That cloud service was integrated with something else, either a different cloud or something on-premise. And a problem with that integration led to downtime. Another 52% said that they missed business deadlines because of poor integration, because they were integrating cloud solutions from multiple clouds. 75% said that they had innovation initiatives stunted by the lack of integration. And 64% said that they could not integrate the public cloud service with their other enterprise apps that were on premise. So a significant challenge, right? I think it's, as you look at public clouds and realize that there's a lot of choices out there, uh, while it may be compelling for you to pick the best of breed in each category uh, to run all the different facets of your business, um, you may also want to stop and think about you know, the full portfolio of solutions and about the integration problems that are likely to happen. Um, you know, Oracle Cloud right, is uh, something that we announced about three years ago. There are now 23, something like that, services on Oracle Cloud. I'm not going to go through all these boxes, but we aim to provide one of the most comprehensive clouds in the industry today, a full breadth of enterprise applications in the SaaS space, a very comprehensive set of platform services for developers, a full complement of infrastructure services as well. We're the only cloud out there that provides all three layers of the enterprise public cloud. No other cloud does that. And you know, if you talk to Larry or, or Mark Hurd, they'll tell you that the strategy of the company is to really offer pretty much everything in our portfolio as a public cloud subscription service. So over time, we're not there yet, we definitely are not there yet, but over time, you're gonna see Oracle put all of our offerings, all of our you know, very market leading you know, platform technologies, application technologies, and infrastructure technologies as a cloud service. So, let me, let me wrap this up and then I'll, I'll, I want to show you a quick little video at the end as well. Here are the 10 myths that I showed you today. Everything will go to the public cloud. Actually, we think that it'll be a combination of public and private. You're either cloud or you're not. No, we actually think that it's an evolution and there, there are degrees of gray in between black and white. Clouds are one size fits all. No, actually there are many different kinds of clouds, you know, platform, uh, infrastructure, uh, applications, public, private, managed, and hybrid, and customers have a lot of different choices um, when it comes to choosing a cloud offering. Virtualization equals cloud. Um, I think for some people, virtualization is a great start towards cloud, but it is certainly not the only thing you need and not the only kind of cloud out there. Reducing costs is the biggest benefit of cloud. It tends to be one of the initial drivers, but we see um, you know, the desire for faster deployments, the desire for agility, superseding the cost imperative. Clouds only run on commodity components. It's, it's a valid you know, architecture to build your cloud that way, but we think that engineered systems offer an important alternative that offers not only better performance, but also better TCO. Clouds will lock you in. Um, it's possible, they might lock you in. You better be careful and, and pick a cloud that, that enables you to change your mind later. Make sure it's based on standards, make sure you can get your data back, et cetera. Cloud is all pay per use. Um, it tends to be, but there are different flavors of, of pricing in cloud, and be sure you take a look at that when you, when you select a cloud service. Public clouds are not secure. Um, I think that that sentiment is shifting over time, and for some, use of public cloud services is a better alternative than relying on in-house um, IT to manage data and, and compliance. 
Um, and then choose best of breed clouds for every need. Um, that may be a valid approach, but be aware that that creates integration issues for you. So, summary. Um, myths about cloud computing continue to abound. There are many misconceptions and myths out there. You ought to you know, just be aware of them, um, do your homework, understand what your roadmap is, your individual company's roadmap, and how it impacts your business. You have a unique roadmap from everyone else. We cannot dictate to you what this is the pattern that we see for everybody. Um, you need to devise your own strategy and your own roadmap. But by making the right choices, we really think that cloud can deliver um, tremendous business value, tremendous flexibility, tremendous choice as well. So. Uh, okay, this is our social marketing stuff. But before you go, I wanted to share with you one last thing. A number of you have noticed a, a page on your chair that talks about Cloud Odyssey. This is a, an interesting program that we've created uh, coming out early 2014. Cloud Odyssey is a movie. It's about um, uh, an ordinary man um, on the journey to cloud. Would you uh, cue this and, and play it for us? speak to us in our in our booth you can also follow along on this Facebook page but the movie is coming out the full movie is coming out early next year and come to one of our events and take a look at it for yourself um, I guess I'll close with this this is a, a, a list of all the other Oracle sessions that you can come and attend and and there's our booth as well if you have some more time later today um, and have a, a desire to learn more about Oracle's solutions, please come talk to one of our, set, one of our sessions. Thanks very much for you. Let's give it up, please, for Oracle with that extraordinary movie. Thank you so much.